This sequence of videos uh, corresponds to the beginning of chapter 7 and is on interacting objects. I would say that section 7.1 and 7.2 are very related. This is also very related to section 7.3 where we explicitly call these ideas Newton's third law. A lot of what we're talking about now is still about Newton's third law, we're just not calling it that. So this is really related to 7.3, so that will help clarify some of the things that we're talking about in this sequence of videos. So the goals is that we want to actually identify what action-reaction pairs of forces are, and that's a really important step for any type of problem involving interacting objects. We're going to define what we mean when we talk about the system versus the environment. This is an idea that comes up now in forces, and it's going to return later when we talk about energy and thermodynamics as well. Finally, we want to start drawing free body diagrams for multiple objects when they're interacting. So we're again drawing free body diagrams, but there's something new we do to show how they interact. So the learning outcomes for these series of videos, we're thinking about representing. Again, how we draw these free body diagrams matters. That's where your physics uh, actually is. And here we're going to be drawing how they interact. So we are furthering our understanding of free body diagrams, which is how we represent force problems. Next, we are easing our way into some problem solving with interacting objects. Uh, this will come back much more in the next section, 7.3. So interactions, we mean something specific when we talk about interactions in physics class. And this is two objects that are normally in contact. Now they don't have to be in contact, which we'll come back later, but for now let's think about simple cases where things are in contact. So if we have a hammer hitting a nail, that drives the nail into the wood or whatever the nail is in. However, the nail also hits the hammer in the process. And your book uses an analogy that I really like, which is that if you imagine the hammer being made out of glass, you can hopefully imagine then if you hit the nail with your glass hammer, your hammer's probably going to break. And that's indicative of the fact that your nail is also exerting a force on the hammer. So another situation uh, related to this is a bat hitting a ball that we know that the bat is exerting a force on the ball since the ball might go flying off into the stands or whatever that happens in baseball, softball, whatever sport this is. Um, on the flip side of this, if you've ever actually batted before, you can feel when the ball hits the bat. So the bat does exert a force on the ball, but the ball is also exerting a force on the bat. So this gets into our idea of action-reaction pairs, that there are these forces that are going in both directions, but this is also the idea of an interaction. We can clearly identify two objects that are in contact. Later, when we talk about gravity, they don't have to be in contact, but they're, something's happening. They're hitting each other, basically. Um, it doesn't have to be momentarily. Like, if you think about this, you might go, oh, well, the ball hits it quickly and bounces off. That's what we mean. If I push up against another person, like if we're both standing there, we put our hands out and we push against one another and we stay in contact, that's also an interaction. So really you can think about this as an interaction are two objects that are exerting forces on each other. So what do we mean when we say an action-reaction pair? Now, the first thing is that we're saying one object exerts a force on the other. And something that's really important here is that this is symmetric. So in a way, you could just call this an action-action pair. That it isn't that one force is more important than the other, or one force is bigger than the other. That's not true. They're symmetric. So calling it an action-action pair maybe is less catchy, but the point is there's not one force that's more important than the other. You can't identify one specifically as the action, the other as the reaction. They're just symmetric. So this is going to come back when we talk about Newton's third law, good old Newton, but they are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So what does that mean? So in this case, you see that you have one force to the left, and you have a different force to the right, and they are the same size. So that's all. Now, what's important 
is that we are denoting which force is which. The book does this with subscripts. I would really encourage you to match this uh, formalism, to match this notation. We have, for instance, the force of x on y. And remember, back at the beginning of chapter 5, when we talked about what forces are, we said that forces always have a clearly identifiable agent and a clearly identifiable object. So this is your agent. And this is your object. So in the case where we have the force of A on B, this is the force, this blue force to the right of block A, pushing on block B. So that's what this means. And that's probably not too hard to think about, but once this is one minor detail in a much bigger problem, these little notational conventions will help you a lot. So please be careful about this. Again, we're saying agent on object is our notation here in the subscripts. Finally, and this is again Newton's third law and very important, is that these action-reaction pairs always exist. It isn't that certain forces have a reaction. It's that for every single force that we can identify, we can always identify its Newton's third law pair other force, so its reaction. What that means is that if you think you've identified a force and you claim that it does not have a reaction, that means that either you don't see what the reaction is, you're making a mistake, or you have identified something that is not a force. So going back to some of the things we've talked about earlier with things that are not forces, such as a ball flying through the air does not have force of motion. If you said that there was a force of motion, well, what is the agent? What is the opposite reaction force? So every single real force has a reaction force. So what we have to now move into is thinking about our multiple objects that are interacting. Up till now, we've usually been talking about single, well, here it says single particle dynamics, and in this case, one object that can be simplified down to a particle dynamic, so study of forces. So we just say, hey, I have my object, and I have a bunch of forces that are acting on it. This is what we've been doing now for uh, two chapters force diagrams or free body diagram, right? Good old free body diagram. Now, we are going to be considering something else, which is more than one object. And what we are doing now is creating a new type of diagram. And this picture on the right isn't fully the diagram, but I want to talk you through thinking about it. So in this case, every line is a pair of forces. So what that means is that this inter line tells you that there's going to be A on C and C on A, two forces there. So now note that there's two forces, or sorry, two lines connecting A and B. Oh dear. That doesn't mean that there's two forces. That actually means that there's two pairs. So why might that be? Well, one might be a normal force pair, and one might be a friction force pair. And we will do an example uh, with this to try to be more specific and make this more clear. And, uh, you know, this third one is then going, sorry, fourth, I'm not good at counting, is again going to have a B on C and A, C on B. And usually we're going to be able to identify these very clearly, like maybe these are gravitational forces. But for now, the point is to just understand that each line is a pair of forces.